our next speaker this morning is Sharon Pearson. Sharon is a professor at St. Louis Community College. Uh, Sharon holds a master's degree in history from the University of Missouri St. Louis and in teaching English as a second language from the University of Illinois. She has taught at St. Louis Community College for 20 years. Sharon works primarily with archival documents to research early St. Louis. In 2010, the Center for French Colonial Studies published her thesis, Standing Up for Indians, Baptism Registers as an Untapped Source for Multicultural Relations in St. Louis, 1766 to 1821. More recently, Sharon has coll collaborated with Carl Eckberg, the leading historian of French Illinois, on an article about St. Louis maps that appeared in the Gateway, the magazine of the Missouri History Museum. Please welcome, help me welcome Sharon Pearson for Building the Village of St. Louis, Evidence from the Archives. Thank you. Um, my name is Sharon Pearson. I, I tell my students, no, it, I, I tell my, people aren't used to this name, um, but my uh, grandfather came to the United States when he was a boy, and I'm guessing they didn't speak English. And so this is how our name ended up in the immigration uh, records. And I don't, I didn't know that and, until really about a decade ago or so. I guess maybe it's fate that I turned out to be an English teacher. <laughs> <laughs> um, and when I got married, uh, my husband's name is Etemadi de Ami, and I said, nobody's ever going to get that. So, <laughs> so I, I stuck with this. Um, so thank you. Uh, my presentation is um, not at all like Ken's. I have very few images, and uh, basically you get to look at me, so I apologize. <laughs> uh, it's going to be that way. Um, uh, all right, let me just go ahead. Uh, you might recognize this. This is um, from one of the Dufosa maps of 1767. Um, that was uh, in, in the Gateway article, and this is my favorite little uh, blow up of, of the section of that map. So I'm going to talk to you about a, a very uh, circumscribed time um, uh, uh, range uh, from the 1760s to the 1770s. It's really hard for me to go past 1775. Um, I, I know, it's just, it's just too late. Uh, and in fact, these days I tend to be going backwards in time rather than rather than forward. So my area of interest really is the beginning of St. Louis, and uh, I, I want to thank uh, Bonnie for inviting me and being gracious enough to allow me to talk about St. Louis. And in fact, the archives in St. Louis are far less known um, than the St. Genevieve archives. So as I'm going through, I would encourage you to make some comparisons and then maybe we can um, uh, talk to some of that at, at the end. So, um, you know, I laugh at my husband when he sits in front of the television and studies the remotes. Um, this is different from anything I've, I've ever had before, so um, uh, I'll push buttons and we'll see what happens. And, and Bob's going to come to my rescue if necessary. <laughs> Louis Saint-Ange de Belle Rive was the last French commandant of Upper Louisiana when he relinquished Fort Deschartes to British Captain Thomas Sterling in, in October 1765. The transfer of the eastern part of French Illinois uh, to British control was affected, but the western part of French Illinois still very much existed. And Saint-Ange moved his government, lock, stock, and barrel to the embryonic village of St. Louis although probably in stages over several months. His government was a three-man operation, soon reduced to two, after the death of Judge Joseph Lefebvre. Joseph Labouxier was his notary, the royal notary. He was St. Ange's right-hand man for the duration of his administration in this new location. The duration of his administration, that's until 1770. Uh, Joseph Labouxier was responsible for creating 200-some legal documents during St. Ange's tenure, and he continued to write uh, French documents under the Spanish government, albeit in a diminished uh, role, um, after 1770. The documents that Labouxier penned were the core of the French and Spanish archives in the Missouri History Museum Research Library in St. Louis, 
This is an exceedingly rich set of documents, yet vastly underused and unexplored. Um, they're the best sources for our understanding of the first years of St. Louis. Um, notable exceptions would be Frederick Billen in the 19th century and Charles Peterson in the 20th century. Um, so I look at papers, and you asked about connections to St. Genevieve. When I come down here and I see things, wow. <laughs> um, because I, I look at the words. I, I do the words on the pages, and that's also why I don't have a lot of slides. Um, because I thought if I showed you a lot of French documents, I don't know what, what you would think. I don't know what Cece would think, and what Cece thinks is very important. <laughs> um, uh, documents from French and Spanish archives that are relevant to today's meeting include contracts and agreements, but for today I will set aside the fur trade contracts and the agreements for slave sales, and I'll look at the construction contracts and sales agreements uh, for land and houses. There are additional documents besides these that aid in our understanding of property, and those are the estate inventories. These are generally the list of the objects of everyday life, uh, personal property, along with the real property, the land and the structures. These are acquisitions that fell into the community of goods of married couples. And of course, in St. Louis, there were lots of single men. Uh, so we see those as well, estate inventories of the men. Regarding that property, uh, for those of you who like the bottom line up front, um, the village of St. Louis in the early years, up to 1770, was dominated by humble rather than extravagant structures and of such a design that the appearance of the village was decidedly more Canadian than Creole. Even in Dufasa's simple rendering here, uh, you can see more of the Canadian gestalt. Okay, let's see if I can make this go. <laughs> that was a cool. Okay, that was about it. You just saw just about it. <laughs> um, okay, well, uh, before I get into the specific buildings, though, I want to say a few words on land distribution because several aspects of early land apportionment in St. Louis have been largely a matter of uh, myth, uh, legend, conjecture, all that stuff that isn't real. Um, St. Louis, like all other Illinois country villages, was organized with a tripartite pattern of land usage. First there was the compact village, then outside the village there were plowlands in large tracts measured off in our pond, and last the commons for grazing livestock and collecting firewood. Land grants established formal title to property and they began to be recorded in May 1766 not surprisingly, with the notary Joseph Labusier receiving the first grant uh, for a town lot. Uh, the grants are found in transcription in books called the Libre Terrienne, and all land in St. Louis was considered to be of the Domaine de Bois, in other words, the king's land. And authority for making land grants rested with the commandant. Some of you might realize those are kind of fighting words, but anyway, you can just take my word for it. <laughs> Still, um, it's likely that before St. Ange took up permanent residence uh, in the village of St. Louis, which was summer or autumn 1765, it's likely that an assembly of villagers made decisions about the layout of the town by common consent because this was a common practice in the Illinois country. Uh, verbal land grants were also common in Louisiana, and they are mentioned in many records at the point when formal titles were drawn up. Uh, St. Ange did not uh, convey equal sized town lots to all residents. And if you're familiar with Frederick Codis's uh, uh, reconstructed um, uh, maps of, of who lived where, uh, you can see that. The important folk uh, received a full town block. Uh, Pierre Laquid had an entire block, Joseph Le Boussier did, uh, Pierre Francois de Volsi, and Francois Louis Picote de Belester. These last two guys. Uh, um, <coughs> were each married to a niece of the commandant, Louis Saint um, well, <laughs> And there were other important men um, in the village as well, the surgeon, André Auguste Condé, the slave owner and farmer, Miller, Joseph Taillon, 
the captain of the militia, uh, Jean-Baptiste Martini, um, they each had a half, um, half lot. Uh, but the occupation of some town sites occurred with no official authorization whatsoever. And again, looking at the records, you can see that it's kind of fuzzy language. Um, so no authorization, uh, verbal or written, which we might call squatting. Um, and then um, one last thing about uh, the land distribution was the um, homesteading provision. A homesteading provision accompanied all land grants, and it meant that uh, land had to be improved uh, within a year and a day from the date of the grant. Uh, this was a deeply Im embedded uh, expectation. A variety of structures might be considered improvements. In addition to residences, we see stables, barns, pigsties, slave cabins, poultry sheds, orchards, uh, kitchen gardens, and occasionally, and later, freestanding kitchens. Um, Failure to fulfill the homesteading provision meant um, that the lot would be repossessed, repossessed and reintegrated uh, with the royal domain. And this repossession explains the movement of some properties uh, from, from one to another that, that you might see. Um, and actually, the, the chain of title is really important um, uh, even at this time. Um, Bob, I'm just going to ask you a few things. Thank you. Um, again, another image from uh, one of the Dufosa maps. Residential lots uh, in the older French towns in the Illinois country, namely Kaskaskia and St. Genevieve, tended to be more or less square. And although it kind of looks like that on this picture, that um, is not uh, uh, how it was in St. Louis. St. Louis, like New Orleans, had rectangular lots measured in French P. Uh, PA. And I wasn't sure who was going to be here um, today, so um, those of you who know, how big is, how long is a French PA? Oh, okay, sorry. Too, too, too much hesitation. A little over a foot. It's a little more than a foot. Um, so the, the measurements were given in, in PA, which is a little bit more than a foot. So when I give the measurements, just do a little math and help, okay. help you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, as far as surveying goes, um, it seems that there were no uh, engineers in St. Louis until Guy du Fossat showed up in 1767, along with uh, Martin Duralde, who, who started the official surveying and described in very exact surveying terms of the dimensions of lots. At any rate, as new settlers moved into St. Louis and more town lots were conveyed, uh, this configuration emerged, again, this is uh, not exact, but it's, it's beautiful. Uh, like St. Genevieve, uh, St. Louis was a string town with um, two main streets uh, running more or less parallel to the Mississippi and the side streets um, intersecting at right <coughs> So this was 1767. The basic configuration was al uh, already there. It remained the same throughout the colonial period, and when Captain Amos Stoddard arrived in 1804, he commented on this, yes. Do you know where this is located approximately in present day St. Louis? <coughs> is that river there, is that sewer, any the idea? This is the arch. The arch. Under the arch? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's a good thing that I love documents because you can't go out in St. Louis and look at anything. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, this, it's all under the arch. A Laclede's government house, uh, Bob Moore told me, is about where the south leg of the arch is. And Laclede's uh, government house, uh, I don't know where it's supposed to be here, but it, it was uh, fairly central. So the, the south leg of the arch. Okay, Bob. You don't want to play Bobby Moore, do you? Um, uh, yeah. This is milk. Um, this is uh, milk. Uh, lately called Mill Creek. Mill Creek. Um, mm -hmm. Which was there for a long time, dammed up to make uh, Chateau's Pond. And, yeah. The uh, the cross or the X in the middle of yes represents the church. But it was not there. Just mm -hmm. um, uh, in seventeen. It's hard to say uh, exactly what was uh, there in 1767. When you look at um, the Catholic Church histories, they say the first uh, actual edifice was dedicated in 1770, and uh, the first 
baptism states that uh, it was conducted under a tent because there was no building. Um, so again, we don't believe this is exact. This is not where the church lot was. It was uh, uh, further back. Okay, thank you. On January 21st, 1766, occurred the first real estate transaction in St. Louis for which a written record remains. In fact, this is the earliest known document of any kind drafted in St. Louis. Uh, the village was not yet two years old, and though there are no documents from that famous weekend in 1764 mm -hmm. until the time, uh, until this time, we are able to fill in a lot of the information just by what is in the documents that were created at this time. Um, and in fact, this is a wonderfully detailed uh, document for the first document that was written in St. Louis, and perhaps it was for uh, the celebration 50 years ago. The History Museum blew it up and put it on uh, backing, and, and I hope they'll drag that out again so that, uh, so that everybody can look at it. Um, so the village was uh, not quite uh, two years old. Um, this uh, document illustrates an important characteristic of land allocation, plus it gives the first description of a house. Uh, Jacques Denis was a master woodworker and he was selling to Antoine Baer and company half a town lot. Um, half a town lot is the 60 by 150 PA. Um, the standard was 120 uh, by 150 and it contained a small house. Bear was one of the first St. Louis negociants, uh, which were businessmen and a role something like wholesalers. The document states that the house belonged to Denis because he had built it, and the lot belonged to him because it had been granted to him following the practices and customs of the said place, meaning the Illinois country, being from the king's domain and having no fees, rents, or obligations attached to it. Uh, Lucier was fairly complete in his um, documents, and so uh, this appears in <coughs> uh, a number of migrants. This phrase makes it clear that uh, Denis had unencumbered proprietorship of the land, as in the rest of the Illinois country, uh, there was no seigneurial or manorial system that ever took root. So let's take a quick look at what Denis was selling. Um, no dimensions of the house were given in the sales contract, and unfortunately this is true in, in many, many uh, documents. Um, but we can see it was built in Poteau on, on Terre Fashion. Um, it was Pierre Bate, uh, which means? Between the posts, there were stones. Okay, good. Redefined. Um, it had a stone chimney, uh, and it was roofed with hand-split wooden shingles, um, bardo. Uh, the house, however, was not entirely completed, for no ceiling existed between the living quarters and the attic. And this is where reading the documents gets very interesting, because there are all kinds of little conditions or things that aren't quite right. And um, in those little comments lie a lot of uh, wonderful information. Most houses in St. Louis were extremely small by modern American standards. Some residences measured only 15 by 12 pie, uh, in which case they were sometimes identified as cabana or maisonette. Even Francois-Louis Picote de Bonnestre married to a niece of St. Ange. He was granted a full block in the town, but he improved a lot with a house that measured only 25 by 20 uh, pie outside mm -hmm. dimensions. Um, his house, uh, uh, the like a uh, great many in the early village, was constructed with exterior walls, uh, also put on here. Um, it was fast, it was cheap, <coughs> and that's kind of what they needed at the time. By comparison, Pierre Leclerc had a commodious residence out on the Grand Prairie, also described as put on terre. Um, it was 80 pied long, 80 pied long, again, um, the, the officer was 20 by 25, and this was 80. Sorry, don't have the other width um, dimension on the house. So it was 80 pay long. It was divided into several <laughs> apartments. Um, it was semi-rural out on the prairie. Uh, also had several slave cabins, a barn, an orchard, and a kitchen garden. Um, pretty much a full-scale plantation that was very unusual uh, in the Illinois country. But back to the village. I'm just going to put this down so I'm not even tempted. Um, Alexis Mary 
Victoria was a very early resident of St. Louis, appearing on the May 1766 census and in the Livre Terrien, um, uh, uh, fairly active in, in acquiring um, land. Um, in 1769, uh, he acquired a second town lot. Uh, Mary was married, had a son, owned an Indian slave boy, and had an indentured child living in his household. And on March 2nd, 1770, he sold to Jean-Baptiste Saki what may be considered a typical St. Louis residential property at the time. Um, the lot was the standard 120 by 150 PA. It contained a vertical log house with a stone fireplace and chimney and, then, and a cellar. Um, the property also included a small cabin, wasn't specified if it was a slave cabin or not, um, a barn or stable and a garden. Modern terminology doesn't work really well, but this was kind of middle class uh, for what we see in St. Louis in these early years. Of course, a, a more sophisticated and time-consuming method of construction than, well, what are you doing? <laughs> than the Poton Terre was to build on wooden sills, which rested on stone foundations. Um, Sometime this method was identified as on Chopin. Go ahead and enjoy that until I get there. Meaning frame with large timbers. Other times uh, you do see the phrase uh, potos or soul, but uh, not, not so much in early St. Louis. Um, again, the potos or soul, meaning the vertical posts were mortised into sills rather than being set in the ground. On April 21st, 1770, our friend Jacques Denis contracted to build for Jacques Chauvin a negociant, a house 20 by 25 PA. Again, a negociant is, is a big time merchant, and this is a 20 by 25 PA house. Uh, with two doors and four windows, including shutters, and the wall construction was to be on Chapon with white and red vertical oak posts set on sills. Um, finally, some houses in St. Louis had uh, exterior walls made of stone. Pierre Laclede's townhouse was one of these. Outcroppings of limestone were plentiful, but the best was located a short way up the Missouri River. This is the quarry, this is the Missouri River. Uh, this is Coldwater Creek, which is still there, and in fact, the quarry is still there. Um, it was, uh, as you can see, convenient uh, for loading the stone onto raft or barge and taking it down to St. Louis. And there's a great uh, little document, I can't remember who it was made with, but it actually says, bring uh, the stone to Laclede's landing. And, and yeah, that's cool, you love to see that. <laughs> um, although people debate about exactly where Laclede's landing was, but we won't get into that. Um, so, uh, St. Louis counted several stonemasons among its earliest inhabitants whom residents might contract for a stone foundation or a house as uh, Pierre Laclede and um, Joseph Lebrasse did and several others. Um, so let me sum up, summarize. Uh, building materials, what we've seen in the records, uh, white and red oak for uh, outer walls um, and uh, cedar, I don't have that right here. Some, um, some houses, uh, most were, were roofed with uh, shingles, the bardos, some were thatched with straw, some had planks, a few were even roofed with bark. Um, and with bark, it never said bark of what, uh, so um, perhaps uh, oak, hickory, elm. Cottonwood was the favorite wood for ceiling planks. Uh, it was plentiful, fine grain, easy to, easy to uh, hew. Uh, most of the early St. Louis um, houses had stone chimneys. Um, and, and fireplaces. A few uh, more modest houses had clay chimneys, and we'll see one of those in a few minutes. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, Antoine Hubert, among his many other enterprises, set himself up as a general building contractor. He even made an agreement with Jacques Denis that Jacques Denis would work exclusively for him. Um, and on July 17th, Hubert contracted to build a house for a fellow negociant, Louis Labert. Uh, even though Lambert lived in New Orleans, he had been operating in and out of St. Louis since 1766. And this contract with Hubert uh, is the most detailed uh, description of a poteau and terre structure. And I think it's because he was leaving town and he wanted to get stuff in writing exactly what it was supposed to um, look like. Uh, and he said he would be sending people around to check up on the quality of, and progress uh, of, of his house. 
Um, so the house was to be uh, 3522K of Poto uh with an up on T, uh, which is often translated as shed, but I think when I finish this description, you'll say shed is not a very good word for that. Um, so the Alpanti was um, on one end, a double stone chimney, which means uh, two fireplaces with one stone flue, uh, connecting the house and the Alpanti. Wood shingles, the same on both parts. Um, the master posts, those in the corners and on either side of the windows and doors would be of red cedar um, and the remaining of white oak. A uh, window would be located in each of the four corners, and the floor and ceiling would be fashioned of well planed tongue and roof planks. Um, and the floor would be just one pie above street level, um, ceiling eight pie above the floor. There would be an interior wall to divide Lambert's house into two basic components, a salle and chambre. Uh, the first intended to serve as his office, the second as his bedroom. Two exterior doors would face one another across the cell, and near one of these, an interior door would connect the two rooms. The apanti would have one exterior door and a window, and the floor and ceiling was to be exactly the same, uh, exactly the same as in the main house. Under the house, Lambert would have a cellar, 20 by 14 pie and six pie deep, and the entire structure inside and out, including the apanti, would have a coat of lime-based whitewash. Um, so that's, that's about as good as it gets. Okay, excellent. Okay, so we gotta go again. We gotta talk about porches. Um, uh, Galerie are engraved in historical memory as ubiquitous features of Illinois country houses. Uh, indeed, the word itself has become almost a litmus test for what you believe about this time period. Uh, porches stand out on the colonial houses that are still here and may be seen in early illustrations and photographs of long gone early St. Louis houses. Um, but in, in examining more than 50 building contracts, 550 building contracts and bills of sale for the period 1766 to 1770, no mention of any gallery of any sort on any residence in St. Louis. Um, this couldn't have been an oversight by Le Boussier, who drafted almost all of the property descriptions. Um, even his assistant who drafted a couple uh, during this time, there's, there's no mention of any um, porch. And if you um, remember along there's house there, the floor was to be elevated uh, one k above street level, so that's about a foot. And that is not the same as the platform, um, the raised platform style. <laughs> Um, so this leads us to conclude that early St. Louis houses were in appearance, in appearance more Canadian than French, Mississippian, Louisianian, um, and that may be because the majority of residents of uh, St. Louis in the earliest years were from Canada. Um, this is in um, Peterson's article, and you know. I have to say, I just picked up Peterson's book last night, okay? <laughs> I tend to read all the documents and then I will go and see what somebody else has, has said about it. And there's this wonderful uh, little comment by Peterson that someone had interviewed Auguste Chateau about the layout of his first house as he remembered it, and Peterson made the comment, but Chateau forgot to say anything about the gallery. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's a, a beautiful picture of the uh, Dodier, I think it's the Dodier Saki house, and, and I don't know exactly where the title went. And then he had 1766 question mark. And um, it's, it's got beautiful porches. So I think the 1766 definitely is, is a question mark. But I will give you an example. In 1778, getting out of my time now. 1778, Louis Bissonnet, uh, a fur trader who worked up the Missouri River, sold his stone house to Louis Dubre and his wife, Suzanne Santus. Uh, Dubre was born in France. He started out his life in St. Louis, a single man with a cow. Um, but he married his French wife in 1772, and their family grew in size in the usual St. Louis fashion. And Dubre was a very ambitious and very successful businessman. But the house that Bissonnet, the fur trader, sold the Dubrays uh, was described as 40 pie in length, avec des galeries autour, with uh, galleries all around. And that was 1778. 
Um, this was a house then that possessed the Creole features that Peterson described as char characteristic of colonial St. Louis. Um, but the local architectural syncretism in those very first years was more Illinois country Canadian, uh, Pateau and Terre houses with a Canadian. promised you a picture of the document. <laughs> um, Charles Peterson described the Illinois country villages as little islands of civilization in a vast wilderness. That civilization was manifest in architecture, but also in people, their customs, and their material possessions. And for me, you have to put all of these together, and then we can talk about the building of St. Louis. So I would like to conclude today with a story of an early St. Louis family this was a family of modest means, not a wealthy family, but nevertheless one of St. Louis's founding families, enumerated on that first census in 1766. Louis Briard de Marouche was head of a household that had seven people, um, no slaves, and in spring 1766, no agricultural land. The family owned a horse, two cattle, and a pig, and this was the beginning. In 1757, Briard had married Marie Anne Gérard Roussillier um, at Fort de Chartres, and the next year their first child, a daughter, was born. In 1763, a son they named Louis. The family were in St. Genevieve in May 1764 for the baptism of this child, uh, but it's very likely they were on their way to establishing the St. Louis residence. There was no priest in St. Louis in 1764. By May 1766, the La Roche family was established in St. Louis, uh, as were Marie Anne's mother and stepfather. The La Roche household included Louis' nephew, Ignace, and a Joseph La Roche I can't positively identify, but someday I will. Um, their house had a clay chimney rather than stone, perhaps indicating this family was not very flush in assets, uh, because stone chimneys were in fact much more common than clay, and the materials were readily available. In 1768, the nephew Ignace, who lived with his uncle, received his own grant of agricultural land, but likely they all worked together and the family harvested a respectable amount of wheat in 1771. But in 1773, Louis Briard uh, de Laroche uh, died and Marie Anne became the legal guardian of their children, who were still minors. Many widows remarried soon, and the next year, Marie Anne announced her intention to remarry by requesting an inventory of the community property she had accumulated with Briard. This was in keeping with the requirements of the Coutume de Paris, the customary laws under which Briard and Marie Anne had married. Uh, the Coutume required that the inheritance of the widow and children from the first marriage be protected as the new couple acquired property together and the second lee, as they called it, the marriage bed uh, from that second marriage produced more children. Uh, in other words, in many families, these things were kept distinct, and even uh, the Chateau, Pierre Chateau's uh, kids made reference to the fact that um, his children that he had had with uh, Pelagie Kirsero got more stuff than they did, uh, because Pelagie Kirsero was, was a rich young lady when she died. Um, so this inventory describes uh, their property in some detail, and I believe it's because of that role as the inheritance protection uh, for the widow and, and children. The real property is listed in the inventory after the livestock. Um, so this isn't very easy to read, but it says uh, an old house or cabin uh, of uh, Pateau en Terre, uh, covered in, in bark, um, a clay chimney, a pigsty, a, Wood. That's an outdoor oven. Um, the the, the uh, lot was 120, and of course, this was on two different pages, the bottom of one page and the top of the next, so you get two images for one thing. Um, so, um, 120 PA by uh, 150 PA long, um, and then with the, the oven, a garden, and uh, fruit trees all situated in St. Louis, uh, having uh, or fronting on uh, the, the Grand Rue and uh, in the back to the bluffs of the Mississippi. On one side, 
uh, the lot of Louis Marcheteau, and on the other side, a street which separates the lot of Alexis Cote. Um, okay, mm -hmm. quiz. <laughs> this is how much uh, the house and property was worth. Want to try? 550, very good. You got to know how to read the fives. Okay. Um, so that, that was the property, it was 550 livres, and the total uh, estate, the total value of the La Roche estate was 1,458 livres. And again, you need to understand that the value of this estate, depending on the husband she was marrying, um, might be expected to uh, supply the material, um, food, um, they kept, some of them, some folks kept really accurate accounts uh, for the children until they married. So this um, house and, and property uh, was, was the core of the family's assets. It was an old and, and likely small house, but he had made good improvements on his town lot and it had a prime location. And added to that his farming ability and LaRoche had ensured his family um, with much success against the uncertainties of 18th century life, which means death. Um, understanding the context of creation of this archival document can illuminate for me the vital human aspect of the architectural landscape. Last one. Uh, so St. Louis of 1764 to 1770 was a humble village, neither as large nor as wealthy as Kaskaskia or St. Genevieve among the villages of the Illinois country. Most residences were mere vertical log cabins, but a rich diversity of folk resided in them. Canadians, Frenchmen, a few Creoles, black slaves, Indian slaves, merchants, voyageurs, carpenters, farmers, millers, and others. It's a little island of civilization in a vast wilderness. Thank you very much. <laughs> Notice the very many so called marriage contracts in your inventory or your review. It's like I paid you to ask that question. <laughs> yes, what would you like to know? <laughs> well, I don't see so many in the Anglo American side, from at least from Virginia to the Carolinas and later in Tennessee. I just, it struck me, I wonder why they have so many uh, marriage contracts in the Mississippi River. Very marriage contracts were wow. a very French um, thing. Uh, yeah. Yes, and the Couture de Paris spent a lot of time talking about what is community property, uh, how to, um, what, what a wife can do with her property, what a husband can do with his property. Inheritance, oh my gosh, inheritance was hugely important. This was the law, and this is why you have the marriage contracts. Uh, the little bit that I have looked at the American side of, of things, um, there tended not to be prenuptial agreements. Here in St. Genevieve, though, they went all the way up to 1870. And With the people among the French? No. Not? Even the Germans, they're oh. you, and they're called anti-nuptial agreements yeah. by the end. Yeah. Yeah. Anti with an E, right? Yeah. <laughs> they did, they did. Keep going here. Yeah. Um, I haven't looked to see how far they go, but I, I've done a pretty good analysis of those early. Uh, I just wonder if it's because there was more property with the French than these pioneers over there. They were very concerned uh, about how property was um, transferred from one generation to the next. Uh, there are, were still many, many connections with relatives back in Canada who were heirs, who were considered heirs under French law. Um, all, all kinds of reasons. Didn't, didn't French women also have considerably more rights yes. than Absolutely. typical Anglo-American? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, oh gosh, since you brought it up, <laughs> that house that the fur trader um, sold to the merchant, Louis Dupuy and his wife, Suzanne Sentus, <coughs> actually she was the one who was there on the day that the notary did the contract, and there is language explicit to that. Her husband had to give her permission, and that's how you know, uh, is because her friend Le Boussier 
wrote that into the contract that uh, the wife was duly authorized uh, to, to conduct this. The husband had to come by and, and sign the document, and uh, by the end of it, uh, most of the time, Lucia would write as though the man had been present, uh, but in fact it stated up front that she was the one who was uh, doing the deal. What was that name, Suzanne? What? Santos, S-A-I-N-T-O-U-S. <laughs> yes. <laughs> in the contract uh, very early, this house is, or mentions a window where these glazed or simply open. There the is, the, I have not seen any uh, mention, not, not these. Sorry. There's, there's not one that is complete. <laughs> to the satisfaction of, of someone you know, who would want to do um, a, a recreation. Do you ever sign, um, like the building contract for the first Louisville Duke House, for instance, does it match the description of the house in the inventory after the death of his wife? So like the building contract calls for a photo on chair, but the inventory says it's Billy kind of called for a hotel to sell the, the inventory says it was a hotel on care, that kind of discrepancy. I'm going to let you say generally folks argue that particular contract. <laughs> <laughs> um, the archives are incomplete. Every document in the archives in some way is incomplete. And so we can make good guesses about the differences um, that are there, but there is very rarely a, a paper trail that's going to allow us to follow from an original construction. And I tried to be really careful in my language here, uh, not to say that this was the house he built for himself, because I don't know. Yes? I uh, gather from what you say that it, it took a little while for the St. Louis habitant to adopt the uh, <coughs> gallery porch style art. As we can tell. It doesn't seem to have taken any time at all from what you said, and maybe, maybe you can correct my impression, that to adopt to the uh, Louisiana style of labor and the institution of slavery. How do you explain the rapidity with which the cultural fabric seem to include that institution if these were people from Canada and had no familiarity with that institution. Uh, there, there were uh, Indian slaves in New France. Um, the first black slaves in the Illinois country uh, belonged to the Jesuits and, and it's not a I, I think certainly by 1720 and maybe a little bit earlier, there were slaves, uh, in black slaves in the. Slaves. Um, yeah. Right, not in the numbers that were supposed to. Yeah. I was just going to say, I found in some research, I can't remember the exact source, but I know um, labor was really tough and in this area in the Mississippi Valley area, there wasn't, um, I guess, any uh, like recent inventions of like machinery and stuff like that. So I know slavery had a lot to do with the, um, I guess, the difficultness of the labor of um, Yeah, yeah. Areas. and uh, people complained about how expensive it was to hire uh, yeah. laborers and yet there were repeated prohibitions against sending slaves from New Orleans up to Illinois country. Do we have any records of slaves coming from Canada down here? From Canada, no. So they would have come up? Uh, the African slaves, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Funny. I have a question about sellers. Uh-huh. Um, I have a French house, and I was told that from the mid-1800s, the Germans purchased the property. It's from 1795, and they had dug up cellars. So did these houses normally never have cellars when the French um, made uh, them? 
I don't know how common sellers were, but they, yeah, they were common. Yeah. And uh, in some inventories, um, we found that furs were stored in the cellars. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you notice much of a difference in the number of uh, posts on the ground houses as compared with posts? depending on the availability of stone. Stone was available, but for Tolan uh was cheaper. And, and uh, again, the contracts, the, the 50 contracts that, that we looked through, I believe only one was described on Shell Hunt, uh, which would have required the, the, the silks. So the Tolan Terre was, was definitely the, the dominant which so, one? The, uh, just in, in the ground. <coughs> yeah, in the ground, not, not on sills. Um, was there much description that you found in contracts uh, regarding the interior finishing of a, of a house? I mean, ceiling planks, I noticed, but plaster, no plaster? No mention. No mention. Mm -hmm. No mention. Uh, were the cellars necessarily under the house, or were they often separate? Um, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, good question. Yeah. Um, it, there, when it's not explicit, you kind of wonder if maybe they were separate. Um, but again, the language and in inventories um, where I've seen that as, as not explicitly um, under the house. I, I'll venture guesses on a lot of things, but well, I don't know. It'd take a lot more engineering to get it under the house, mm -hmm. the okay. foundation yeah. and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a liability. And, and I haven't done a, a, a comparison on the, on the prices because what furs were worth in 1767 and to what furs were worth in 1777 is, is hard, but we kind of go with a good stone house was 2,000 Did you have the occasion to look at any of their litigation records to get some kind of sense of their legal disputes, whatever it was? There are no litigation records from 1766 to 1770 unless someone is hiding uh, a bunch of documents. <laughs> um, they're, they're, not, they're not part of this collection. They're not in the History Museum. We hope they haven't been destroyed, uh, but um, there aren't any, but, but I mean, the litigation shows up in later decades, and, and again, it, it uh, provides some information about um, the widow, widow Dodier, one of my favorite folks, apparently did not improve her land, and so when there was litigation, uh, one of her parcels of land, so there, when there was litigation, um, her descendants had a very weak case uh, to, to defend it because of the homestead provision. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, okay. Have <laughs> you, you have referred to the custom of Paris. Yes. And many writers and presenters. And, have you ever seen a copy of the custom of Paris? Is it published in English? In <laughs> English. I've never oh, found one. In English. I don't know about it in English. It's online in French. Oh, okay. And I was looking around the room. Um, my colleagues from St. Louis U tells me that the tell me that the St. Louis U library owns uh, owns a copy of it in French. Wow. Um, I, I don't know from what year. I mean it you know it was uh, Have constantly you seen it first? <clears throat> I no. I'm I they were moving the library this past summer and, and I just haven't uh, gotten around to how know. long is it? The couture? Mm -hmm. Um I usually deal with the second volume, which, which uh, is, yeah, is the um, uh, description of property and who's legitimate and who's illegitimate uh, and, and inheritance and, and all that. Um, so, uh, and, and you know, it's a little book. So when I say 500, 700 pages, they're, they're little. It's fun to go back and read that. Thank you very much, Sharon.
get to it, please keep it front of mind and you can address it after the lunch or at the break or this afternoon during the tours. Thank you for watching Channel 798. Thank you for watching Channel 798. Hi, thank you very much for watching Channel 798.